you open your Bibles tonight at the second book of Peter, the third chapter. In three weeks now, I've been preaching on end time events, countdown, the confrontation, war over Jerusalem. Last week, I preached on the, in the midst of all these crises. The decision is still yours. But tonight I want to preach on the subject of God's end time people. The end time and God's end time people. We'll read this chapter together and uh, we might have it down just a little bit, uh, but it just sounds a bit after the time. Third chapter, this second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure mind by way of remembrance. She may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandments of us, the apostles, the Lord and Saviour. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, by the word of God, the heavens, and the word of all, and the earth standing out of the water in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word, are kept in his store, reserved under fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us, Lord, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also, and the works that are therein, shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we according to his promise look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent, that ye may be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless. May God add a blessing to that portion of his precious word. During the last few weeks I've been emphasizing the signs of the times and the Bible prophecies that relate to them. Tonight I want to switch it over a bit and deal more with the people living in the end time, and in particular, God's end time people. Now in every dispensation, every time of major crisis, God has always had his people, always, who have manifested his power, kept his word, and glorified his name. And as we study the history of the Bible, we find that every dispensation has climax in judgment, in judgment upon the gross unrighteousness of man. But there's always, uh, all of these climaxes have always, always produced a band of men and women who have come through that crisis as pure gold. They've developed a mighty overcoming spirit and a mighty overcoming power. The judgment of the flood produced a Noah. The oppression of Israel produced a Gideon. Uh, produced a Samson, Nebuchadnezzar's edicts, uh, produced the three Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, Shach, and Abednego. I have sinned and unrighteous reign produced an Elijah. And so every crisis and every dispensational climax has always produced God's deliverance for the hour and has produced a group of people who have known their God and have been powerful in that period. Now today we are moving undoubtedly and swiftly 
uh, to another great dispensational climax in the history of this planet. And this will be the greatest of them all. This will outdistance every other climax, the flood and every other judgment that ever came upon the earth. The unrighteousness of man is reaching such a peak and such a level that it will again call for the judgments of God. In the second book of Thessalonians, verses 1 to 7, we see there where it tells us uh, that the, the world and mankind will reach a point where God will come forth in flaming fire against the ungodly and against the ungodly speeches which they have committed and against all ungodliness and the wrath of God will come against that unrighteousness and man will be dealt with. Now this time, uh, God is not going to end the dispensation with a flood, but according to the Bible, it's going to be reserved under fire against the day of judgment and the perdition of ungodly men. Let me say tonight that I believe the cup of iniquity of our world age is nearly full. Whenever you read about the judgments of God in the Bible against nation, God waited until their cup of iniquity was full. And when that was full, then God dealt with that tremendous sin condition and uh, judgment fell upon them. And the cup of iniquity of this age is nearly full. The coming climax is the end of this age as we know it. It will be the judgment of God against the gross sins of men against the immorality of man, against the inhumanity of man, and the gross sins of unbelief and of rejection of God's Saviour, Jesus Christ. This dispensation commences at the cross and will end at the rapture. It is called the dispensation of grace. That means it's the period of God's dealing with man under God's grace. But mankind in general has despised the day of grace and because of that, God will have to deal with the situation. I see as I look at the Bible and look at conditions today, that man has shown himself as totally incapable of handling this planet. Brother Pastor John Hewitt said this morning how God had to hand the world over to Adam to, to run the planet and to have dominion on it and so on. But man has shown himself as totally incapable of handling this planet and of producing a peaceful state. He cannot even handle the earth as far as the ecology is concerned. And one of the great concerns of our day is the tremendous destruction that is taking place in the created area of uh, the vegetation and the animal life and all of these sort of things. And man has proved himself to be a failure as far as the charter that God gave him when God gave Adam dominion over every living thing and over the creatures of the sea and the fowls of the air and the earth. What did man prove? That he was not only incapable of having dominion over those things, but he was incapable of exercising dominion over himself. And man proved himself an absolute failure and a moral failure. And man has become to pray and immoral and broken God's laws. And God... Uh, uh, has seen the condition. Man has defiled and corrupted his way upon the earth again. When the days of Noah were in existence, the Bible says God looked at and God saw that man was corrupted, that he was immoral, that he had broken the laws that God had laid down. He came to a place of total depravity and violence filled the earth. And God said, I cannot stand it any longer. I will come and destroy mankind. Now man cannot be trusted with this earth anymore. He is deceitful, he is desperately wicked, and unless God takes a hand, man with his evil mind and weapons of destruction would completely destroy himself and the planet that God gave him to live on and to rule over. And let me tell you something, that is just what the devil wants. You know what the devil would like to do? To so organize and to so operate and manipulate man that he would produce destructive weapons of nuclear power and so on and destroy the earth and destroy everything on it and destroy human life. And that's what the devil would like to happen. The same as the devil's plan to destroy every human individual. 
See, the Bible teaches us, and the Lord said, that the thief comes not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. And God sees and knows uh, that the devil is seeking to destroy us. Why men follow the devil, I don't know. Why they listen to his deceit, I don't know. Because he's only got one purpose, and that is to destroy the earth and to destroy mankind and obliterate God's masterpiece uh, from this planet. But I've got some good news for you tonight. You see, like at the Tower of Babel, they said, we will build a tower that reaches to heaven. But Jesus said, I will build my kingdom. And man, man will never build a kingdom uh, that is successful. Every structure, every kingdom that is not built of God will collapse. Every structure and every kingdom that is not built of God will collapse and be torn down. Only God can build an everlasting kingdom. Only God can build a new world. I think George Bush is great. And he's called a day of prayer in the United States. Today, I believe, the American nation is praying for peace and praying for the boys and the girls at the front and praying for the families. But George Bush has one vision, and that is he's working to introduce a new world. God bless him. But George Bush won't introduce it. Neither will world government men introduce it. Neither will United Nations introduce it. Only God can build a new world. Only God can build a new life. Jesus said, Behold, I make all things new. There's not a person on the face of the earth can remodel his life or change his heart. You cannot get away with that evil that is born in you. We are all born in sin and and shaping an iniquity. And it takes the power of God and the gospel to give you a change of heart and to put a new heart within you and create a right spirit within you. And Jesus is the only one who can stand astride eternity and say, Behold, I make all things new. Not somebody else. Not some guru from the east. Not any antichrist who might raise up, rise up. Only Jesus Christ can make all things new. And only Jesus can make all things new in your life. And it's wonderful to know that He can, and that He will, and He wants to, and He'll do it if you'll only let it. Praise God. As we approach the end of this age, we are reminded from the various choruses we have tonight that our God reigneth. The Bible says, God sitteth in the heaven, and He shall love and have them in derision. Acts 17.31 says God has appointed a day in the which he will judge the world. Who will? God will. In righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained. Whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. I want you to see tonight that God's appointed a day in which he will judge the world. And when he does it, he will do it by Jesus Christ. By the man that he's appointed and ordained and the man who was raised from the dead. And that man who was raised from the dead, the risen man is the only one who qualifies and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now as this war escalates and we see the news after we're into what the third week and new threats are made and the nations of the earth are again talking about nuclear weapons and atomic war this week about the possibility of man destroying himself on this planet. Many people are very fearful. But I want to make a statement tonight, and this is what I truly believe, that God's Word does not teach that man will annihilate the human race, that man will destroy this earth with nuclear weapons. He doesn't teach that. I also want to say that the devil does not have the power to destroy all of God's creation and wipe away mankind. The Bible teaches that God is in control. That faith works. That prayer works. That God has his own plan. A different plan from man's plan and the devil's plan. And I want you to know that that plan is working. That plan is working. And that plan does not include the atomic blast and blow up of the earth, decimating all nations and destroying all men. No, that's not in God's plan at all. God is in control, so don't go away fearful saying the earth is going to blow up. I'm not a bit afraid of nuclear 
of a nuclear explosion or a nuclear holocaust. It's not in the Bible. There will be some spasms and spurts of it, but as far as the total destruction of the earth, it will not happen. God is in control. God has a plan. God's plan includes the evangelization of the world. It includes the restoration of Israel. It includes the rapture of the believers and the final overthrow of Antichrist and the remaining of a remnant of the nations on the earth and Jesus Christ ruling over a repopulated earth in glory and in power for a thousand years. And the church ruling and reigning with it. Amen. Hallelujah. That's not a picture of total a desolation and destruction. Jesus said there would be wars and rumors of wars. A nation would rise against nation. Matthew 24, 6 and 7. But Jesus did not teach that the nations would cease to be or that they would extinguish one another. I believe God has entrusted the power of terminating things to himself and to his believers. There are a number of reasons in the Bible which I want to give you briefly before I get on to the type of people, of God's people at the end of the age. Just briefly, some of the reasons why I believe the devil cannot destroy the earth when he wants to. Number one, and this is interesting tonight, with Jim and Jody going up there to Papua New Guinea and the students beginning to train. And let me emphasize what Pastor Ruth said this morning. I am one of those who believe that you should live in your spirit, in your life, in a state of holiness as if Jesus Christ was coming tonight. But I believe you should work and plan and operate as if he wasn't coming for the next hundred or maybe a thousand years. I don't believe in throwing everything up and saying, well, the Lord's coming next week then. So I won't go to work on Monday. I won't play the gas bill on Thursday. No money. Neither will I eat on Friday. You will. I saw that when I was a boy. The message of the second came in. And people sold up their arms and did all sorts of sort of things. And I can remember hearing about one lady that she did, all she would do was sit in a rocking chair and rock herself there and wait for the Lord to come. Well, she most likely rocked herself to death rather than the skeleton still in that chair, I don't know. That's a long time ago. No, I would say all you young people, keep your plans moving. Amen. If you want to get married, plan to get married. If you want to build a house and buy a house, plan to get and believe God. If I had given up on it, you know, about the time when I got out talking about it all then, you know, there was a time when I was influenced by it. I was influenced by a lot of things when I was a young fellow. You know, oh, there were some funny teachings going around that. One of them was that you, uh, you shouldn't get married, you should give so many years to the Lord, and uh, you should, uh, you know, you shouldn't get married for so many years. Sometimes you were too old to get married by the time that went. That was too big a risk for me to take. And uh, all these other things you see, and don't buy a house, you know, because you might be going out on the Lord's work, and therefore you won't, do, you won't have to be tied down. Now, if I had taken notice of those sort of things, I wouldn't have had a house to live in today. I wouldn't have, that's quite honest. And I obeyed that. I wasn't going to buy a house and I wasn't going to do this and I wasn't going to, until suddenly I got put up in Brisbane one day when I was in a crusade that the landlord was going to sell the house over the top of the head. I got on the plane and came home and I said, I'm going to buy that house in Jesus' name. I'm not going to be caught out like that. And I did. God gave me a miracle. I bought it. I bought another one in this one since. And you know, you want to go on like that. And so don't think, well, oh, pastor's preaching on the second coming. Uh, what's the good of study? What's the good of going to school? What's the good of buying a house? What's the good of that? No, just go on, keep going on, live in place to God. And uh, oh, Jesus said, occupy until I come. Anybody here agree with what I'm saying? Yes. God bless you. See that you do. All right. So we go on from there. One of the reasons why I believe the devil can't destroy this earth when he wants to is the total preaching of the gospel to all nations will determine the end of this age and not a nuclear holocaust. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 14, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the nations, in all the world, from witness to all nations, and then shall the end come. 
So actually in the fact that the unleashing of the Word of God and not the unleashing of man-made missiles will bring about the second coming of Jesus. You see, the Lord really pinpointed it there and said the total preaching of the gospel, that will determine when Jesus comes. For this gospel must be preached in all nations, in all the worlds, a witness. So it's up to us Christians to preach the gospel and not to stop preaching it to all nations. For by doing that, we determine really when the Lord will come back. Now if there are nations that haven't been reached, brother, it's our responsibility to reach them. You should be totally geared to taking the gospel to unreached peoples. And I thank God for the students. You students, God bless you. You're going to help the coming of the Lord to be accelerated. We've got to get the gospel out to all nations. And it's a big thing. And the Lord said, you see, this is one of the governing factors of what the devil thinks. It's what God said. <clears throat> also, the end of this age, it will not be when Jesus comes at the rapture, will not be on a devastated, destroyed planet. But according to what I see in the Bible, it will be similar to the days of Noah. Not to a nuclear war or a holocaust. Matthew 24, 37, 39. Jesus says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. They were eating and drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, building, etc., and so on. So when Jesus described the time right before his second coming, he doesn't describe a scene of devastation. He describes a world on which everybody is going about normal routine business. They're working, they're eating, they're marrying. In fact, he even said oh, that at the point of time when the Lord comes, two shall be together working in the field. So there must be a field, a productive field. And one shall be taken the other left. Two shall be in the bed asleep. One will be a believer and one will be an unbeliever. And the believer will be taken out of the bed and the unbeliever will be left. There's going to be a lot of screaming in bedrooms after the rapture of Jesus Christ. When they, people turn over, unbelieving husbands turn over and see that wife who has wanted to come to church and serve the Lord all those years, she's suddenly gone from his side and nowhere to be found. Or when a, an unbelieving wife has harassed a, a, some husband who wanted to serve God and suddenly he's gone. He's gone in the middle of the night. Or you're in the factory and the machines are all going and the followers alongside of you there and he's a Christian believing in the coming of Jesus. Everything is going normally. The machines are going and uh, he's got his machine operating and you turn around to speak to him and he's gone. And the man along the road who was singing choruses all the time, he's gone and the machines are all going crazy and everything's happening at once. Where have they gone? In the rapture. That's what's going to happen. Oh, glory be to God. And when you go down Princess Highway, and all the cars are driving down there. <laughs> <laughs> Just look out for ODSLA too. <laughs> We're sitting in place of God, holding on to the wheel, and all of a sudden the trumpet sounds. Oh, glory be to God, some fellow driving past who's an unbeliever says, there's a car going along without a driver in it. <laughs> Get off the road quick. And you say, oh, pastor, you're stretching it. No, I'm not. The Bible says two shall be in the field. One shall be taken, the other left. Two shall be in the bed. Now, that's not the scene of a devastated holocaust. That's a scene of life going on fairly normal, wouldn't you think? Yeah. So, uh, I'm just bringing out to you tonight uh, that this age after the rapture uh, is not going to be suddenly wiped out. I great atomic blast. No. God's going to keep things moving along until Jesus comes. There'll be wars and rumours of war and all those sort of things. So the end of this age will be similar to the days of Noah. Also, judgment is God's prerogative. <clears throat> Bible says judgment must begin at the house of God. Do you know that uh, when we were children and boys, that was one of the things that really we heard so much preaching on the second coming, <clears throat> that uh, it really kept us on our toes as far as searching the Lord and Living, uh, living for the Lord. I remember Keith Johnson, whom I knew in those days as a young lad, we used to preach in the streets together. He told me how he got saved. 
Keith's father used to preach on the second coming. They lived down here in Carlton, Lily Street. And he came home one day from school. And he went into the house and he called for his mother. And uh, he couldn't, no answer. So he searched for every room and he ran through the house and there was nobody in the house, nobody in any room, nobody anywhere and he just heard these messages on the second coming and he was convinced that his mother had gone up in the rapture and so he fell on his knees and got saved. Glory be to God. <laughs> But uh, and it really shook him up. Now that's how it will happen. Oh, you say, oh, 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 I love that. Listen to that preacher up there. That's exactly what it says in Peter. In the last days there shall be scoffers. Scoffer. If you're a scoffer, brother, you're one of the signs of the last days. Scoff away. Scoff away. Because you're a sign to us that we're getting close. Scoff louder so that I can hear you. And then so that I know that I'm getting close. Who will cry for the rocks and the mountains to fall upon the day of God's judgment? Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> you know, I wish everybody would get saved. Everybody would get saved. Everybody in the street or something. They don't know their dream. I thought I lived in a respectable area. Um, just one night this week, I woke up at 3 o'clock in the morning. Two doors down. There used to be some nice people lived there, but they moved away and must have left the house for this group of young fellows. But well, it was a nice home, but you should see the, the grass and the weeds, and that's a wilderness. It's terrible. And you've broken down cars all around. It looks terrible. And at three o'clock in the morning, they were drunk and shouting singing on and making a dreadful noise and I don't know who else got up but I got up but I didn't go anywhere near them. And uh, discretion was better part of the dollar. And uh, so uh, at four o'clock they were still going and they must have known that they were disturbing the neighbours and then they're drunk and all week. They were all shouting at 4 a.m. It's 4 o'clock, it's 4 a.m. It's 4 a.m. I know it is, I know it is. They got up, half drunk, half dressed, stumbled down the George's River, jumped in, and come out and throw them up. What a terrible way to live. <laughs> never, and ever since they've been sitting on the veranda looking like dead birds. <laughs> really just sitting there. They were as glum as that, you know. <laughs> Is that life? That's not life, brother. That's been destroyed by the devil. There's nothing in that. They're a disgrace to themselves and the community and everything else. And they're destroying themselves in this way. Now to get on to the sun. <laughs> <laughs> it's your fault, Jim. You took out too much time. <laughs> 2 Peter 3.11 says, Seeing that all these things shall happen, and all these things that we read about in the final shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be? In holy conversations, God. What should God's end time people be like in this present crisis that we're in, in this final hour that we're in? Just briefly, I want to give you five points. You've got your pencil, write them down. Number one, God's end time people should be a prepared people. For Jesus said, Be also ready for in such an hour as you think not. My scripture said there tonight, looking for and hastening unto the day of the Lord. The gospel said, having your loins girt about with truth and your vessels filled with oil. So many places it says, be awake, awake, be alert, be watchful. They are the adjectives that are used there. So God's end time people should, number one, be prepared and be awake and alert and watchful. Number two, God's end time people should be a proclaiming people. Jesus said this gospel must be preached in all nations. And we are the knowers of this generation. We are the Enochs of this time. We've got to tell them. We've got to preach the gospel. I want to say every believer, your number one priority is to preach the gospel. 
You may not get to Bible school or go to New Guinea, but preach it by your life. Preach it by your message. Preach it by your witness. Preach it in all the world. Preach it to every creature and give the Great Commission your number one priority. Thirdly, God's end time people should be a praying people. Jesus said constantly, watch and pray. Luke 21, 36, Jesus says, watch therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape those things that are coming upon the earth and to stand before the Son of Man. So God's end time people should be a people who are praying always. Pray that you'll be ready. Pray for the unsaved. Pray for the backsliders. Pray for those in bondage. Pray for your ungodly loved ones that they don't go to hell. Pray for your preachers. Pray for your evangelists. Pray for your missionaries. Pray for the church. Pray for young children. Pray for babies. Pray for little ones. Pray for the leaders of our nation. Pray for the governments. Pray for the nations. Pray for Israel. Pray for all the nations of the world. God's end time people should be a praying people. Pray, 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 pray. If you're an end time believer, you should be a praying person. You should be here next Friday night at 7.30 with the church. Don't stop home and watch one of those, what do you call them? Soapbox operas or whatever they are, you know? <laughs> up and away or something. <laughs> Fancy stopping home and look, looking at neighbours. I don't have to look at the television for neighbours. I don't. You don't have to. You don't waste your time with that rubbish. You know, that's all fiction. Some man has been paid to write that story and put the worst stuff into it that he can. <coughs> They're always arguing and fighting and separating and killing one another. It's a wonder to me there are enough actors left. <laughs> they kill at least 42 actors a week. It's rubbish. Don't stop home and do that. Pray. If you've got somebody that's unsafe, pray for them. You bring somebody to church, pray that they'll get saved. You've got a young person who's going into sin, has been drinking, or going to some ungodly place. Pray, be here and pray. You've got young children, come and pray. God's end time people should be a praying people. And God's end time people should be a practicing people. What do I mean by that? Practicing holiness. Living the word. I spread there. What kind of people ought we to be in all the holy conversation and godliness? What's your conversation like? You don't have to be with some people very long to know whether they're practicing the holiness of God and they're living right. Our conversation should be a holy conversation. That means it should have, shouldn't have any dirty in it, no spunny jokes, no evil stuff in it whatsoever. It shouldn't be tainted with this world slang and swearing. Christians should never swear and blaspheme. Our holy conversation would not be critical. I cannot stand critical people. I don't like critical people coming to see me. If you come to see me and you want to criticize anybody, you'll get short notice. I don't believe in criticizing any other preacher by the grace of God. In all these years we've been here, I don't think we've criticized any other preacher. We don't criticize preachers, we love them and admire them. I've got nothing to say against any preacher of the gospel except something good. If you want to talk about some bastard that you've been under and running down, don't come to me, brother, you're wasting your time. Because he most likely is a very good friend of mine, isn't he? <laughs> so don't come. Don't come, it's destroying. Don't have anything to do with pretty good people. People have run the church down, run the pastors down. I'll tell you something about that. Touch not the Lord's anointed and do my prophets now. Amen. I've seen men in the ministry that I've been acquainted with over the years and top men. And they have, they have fallen and done things, but I never say a word against them. I don't speak against them, neither is Pastor Ruth. We will not speak against them. We just leave all that with God. Because I tell you what you do, you're touching God's anointed. 
And you see anybody that touches God's anointed, and they'll crash and they'll go down and they repent and come back to God. Don't entertain people that want to run churches down. I don't go and lead or pastors down or leaders down. Should you hear what happened with angel of so and so? Yeah, well, I don't want to hear what happened with angel of so. I want to keep my eyes on Jesus. Yeah. Some people have got a, a whole repertoire, a whole cell of something. Well, they've done these things, but God help us. The Bible says, he that is without sin goes the first stone. And if you want to pull a, 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 a mate out of your brother's eye, you better get the great big beam out of your own eye first. Amen. I hope you enjoy that sort of preaching. I was with A.S. Word. And don't ever shoot your mouth off against the people of God or against the church of God. You might bring the judgment of God on yourself. It's dangerous. You say, how do you know, Pastor? I've been through it, brother. I've seen it happen. Thank God I've survived. Uh, A.S. Worley and I went to Tasmania for a crusade. We were evangelists. And God gave us a crusade in Launceston where we had over 500 decisions for Christ and turned the town upside down. Some of you will know the history of that great crusade. And one of the apostolic brothers down there gave us his house. And he said, you can live in this house, you and all the team, and you can have the house and you can sleep in it and, and live in it free of charge and operate there from the base. So A.S. Worley, our American brother evangelist, put out a law. He said, nobody comes into this house as a part of my team. If you criticize or say anything negative in any way, the moment you do, you're out of the house. And he made a rule that nobody that came in there as a part of the team could criticize, say anything negative. They had to be in faith and no word of criticism was allowed to come in to where we dwelt and we had a revival. Ooh, glory be to God. You know, they started getting the baptism of the Holy Ghost at 5 o'clock in the morning out in the cabbage field. When they were picking up their cabbages, they got filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with tongue. And immediately got in their motor car and came and knocked on the door to tell us they'd been filled with the Spirit at 5 in the morning. Never got to sleep down there. Oh, glory. Oh, isn't it exciting to be a Christian? Amen. If you want to learn how to live without sleep, become a pastor. <laughs> <laughs> we should be practicing holiness, holiness. And the Bible says here in the scripture I read to you, in all conversation, all manner of conversation, in diligence, diligence, that's there in that verse. I read it to you. In peace, wonderful to be at peace to people. Without spot, that always refers to worldliness, for example, without spot or wrinkle. Always worldly, but it says without spot. Worldliness and lust are covered in that. And blameless. What a word, blameless, blameless. Hands up all the blameless people. Don't put your hand up with you. Amen. <laughs> blameless. 1 Thessalonians 5.23, I'll give you this scripture and I'll be closing soon. And it says, the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and your soul and your body be preserved Blameless. Unto what? Unto the coming of the Lord. Hallelujah. That was Paul's prayer. I'll read it again. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 And in Bible still we use that to teach spirit, soul and body. And it says in the very God of peace sanctify you holy and I pray you the whole spirit, soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So if it's possible for us to be sanctified to a state of blamelessness before God, it must be, otherwise God wouldn't have put it in there. And I want to be a sanctified person. I want to be blameless before God. I've got a lot of responsibility as a pastor of an ever-growing church. I don't want to say anything wrong, do anything wrong, treat anybody unkindly, say the wrong word with my mouth. I'm like Pastor Ruth this morning when she said, as she came under conviction, even about sending <coughs> her own log book in the motor car. Well, I even come under conviction. When the magpies fly up on my windowsill while I'm having breakfast, and I'm eating away there, and they're tapping on the windowsill. <laughs> they say, come on, come out, come out, come out. And they won't leave. You know, I have to leave my 
my breakfast and go out and chop the meat up and give it to them. And they have to. Because I feel mean otherwise. I'm, just, I'm eating and they're not. Now, if you've got a sensitive conscience like that, or could you eat your breakfast and the man might too? <laughs> you need a, a sensitive conscience towards God. And the nearer you get to God, the bigger some little things seem. You ever notice that? Oh, yeah. There was a time when you you couldn't do this, you couldn't do that, because your conscience was split. But you sort of let yourself broaden out, and you've involved this and taken that in and be more permissive about this, until those things don't seem to affect. What's happened to your conscience? The Bible says it becomes seared, as like as with a hot iron. We need to have a tender conscience before God, when all of these things, really, when they don't please the Holy Spirit, will trouble us. Now the last thing, is a powerful people. But it's not the last thing. Because those who know their God to be strong and do exploits of power. We're living in the last days. I heard Mustin say that uh, he couldn't see how, this was his opinion, how the Antichrist and some of these fellows could rise up while the church was still here on the earth because he said all oh, God's spiritual people would be after him like a man and cast the devil out of him. Well, oh, that's just what he thought. But you see, what it's looking for now is people filled with the Holy Ghost. God's end time people should be people of power. Daniel said about this period, those who know their God shall be strong and do exploits of power. Jim and Jody, when you get up there to Papua New Guinea, those who know their God, I've been up there, I know what you'll face, but I encourage you to know and to say tonight how that moving in God, God's end time people are a powerful people. People move in the power of the Spirit, people filled with the Holy Ghost, people moving in the power of God, people who are powerful against the devil, people who are using the name of Jesus, the blood of Jesus Christ, the power of the Word and the Holy Spirit. And as I close my few thoughts tonight, God's end time people will be faith people, not people full of doubt and fear. They will be full of faith. They will know God. They will not be running around like frightened rabbits. But they will be like Daniel in the lion's den. They will be like the three Hebrew children of the burning fiery furnace. They will be like Paul on the doomed ship in Acts 28 when he said, Sirs, fear not, be of good cheer. I believe God. And the Bible says this is the victory that I have come of the world, even our faith. I agree with what Pastor Ruth said this morning. God's faith people and God's end time people don't dig holes in the ground uh, to uh, hide in. They don't uh, run to the bush when things get tough. They don't store food in holes and run. I don't believe they do. I believe they stand up and fight. And I like what Pastor Ruth said. Start storing up food for that sort of thing and getting us here in you about will we have enough to eat and the labels will all run out and you'll be eating stale food. <laughs> you know, when it says used by 21st December 1990, you'll have to throw it out. You get what I mean? Yeah, don't be tricked by that sort of thing. I had to laugh when Pastor Ruth said the other day there were people in America that are going up in aeroplanes to fight the spiritual warfare up in the air. <laughs> well, that's about as silly as you can get. <laughs> got nothing to do with that sort of thing, there's no distance. And also, they're putting on, a, a, you know, battle dress, you know? Khaki, battle dress, and, uh, uh, what do you call it? Camouflaged unif uniform uh, to show that they're in a fight against the devil. Well, I don't believe that works because the devil's colour blind in here. <laughs> and also, he's the biggest camouflage expert there is. And he'd see through that any day. That's not where you fight. You fight in the spirit. You fight by the power of God. You resist the devil in Jesus' name. And you move in faith. God's people don't dig holes and do all that sort of thing. They stand up and fight. They believe in miracles. They believe in God's word. They fear not. Because the song we said says the fire cannot burn you and the water cannot drown you. Because if you trust in God, you'll survive. 
Hallelujah. You're feeling better tonight. Amen. Glory be to God. You're ready to go. And you're the one that's going to go up there. Uh, when the Lord comes, I trust that if two of you, in fact, you'll both go up together. You better hang on to your wife tight tonight. Amen. <laughs> Pray with her before she goes to sleep. Make sure she's right with God. And you husbands and you wives do the same. Oh, I'm not joking. This is getting very close. You cannot afford to make wrong associations or to get out of step with God or to miss the Lord. The coming of Jesus is near at hand. God's end time people are those who are walking with Him. Those who are already are praying people and a prepared people and a preaching people. Let's pay out a word of prayer. Thank you, Father, for your word tonight. And thank you for this great day we've had together in the fellowship of the church. And we thank you, Lord, that we know that you are building your church, Lord. This structure is upon the foundation of Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone, the apostles and prophets, the word of God, the experience of the church. And, Lord, thy kingdom has been built you said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I pray that every believing Christian here tonight will know that they're on God's side and God is on their side. That God is in control. That the Lord reigns. Hallelujah. God reigns. Everybody say, the Lord reigns. The Lord reigns. The Lord reigns. The Lord reigns. God reigns tonight. Put your hand in. Put your life in His hand. Trust in His plan. Believe in Him. Walk with Him. Be an end time person in all manner of holy conversation and godliness. Prepare for the coming of the Lord. Preaching the gospel. Committed to working for Jesus Christ. Amen. Giving your life to Him and letting Him have His way in your heart. In Jesus' name. Amen. While every head is bowed, every eye closed. There may be some tonight who know in your heart you're not prepared for the coming of the Lord. And maybe the Holy Spirit said to me when I was sitting down there, no, maybe about him saying, but he said, there are some here tonight, and I wasn't looking at you, so I didn't know you or who was there. But the Lord said, there are some here tonight who need to repent in their heart and get right with me, because my coming is so close, they need to be sorry for the things that they have done, and ask me to cleanse them in the blood, and to get washed and get ready and be prepared, for I am coming very soon. I give you that message out of my heart tonight. Is there anybody in this service who will say, Preacher, I want to be ready for the coming of the Lord. I want my life to be right. I want to be one of God's end time people who are living for God, working for God, preaching the gospel, ministering to the needs of people. I want to be there, ready when Jesus comes. Would you like to raise your hand for prayer? I'll be happy to pray for you tonight. Who would like to be praying? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Who else right now? Raise them up. Glory be to God. Oh, praise God. That's good. Hallelujah. That's good. Someone else right now. Right across the water. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're going to stand and sing a chorus. Rain in me. Rain in me. Rain in me. Let's sing it. And as we sing it, come down to the altar. Come and stand here and start to pray. And, and Pastor Ruth and the other altar workers will come tonight immediately, not waiting. But let's have a gathering around the precious feet of Jesus tonight and make sure you're right. Let's all stand together now as we sing. And the new pastor and others, you come right now. Rain in me, hallelujah. <laughs>
tell you something that I feel deep in my spirit. The cleansing power of the blood is very effective in this service tonight. I've been impressed by it right from the very beginning. If you have transgressed God's laws, if you have breathed the Holy Spirit, if you have done or said something you shouldn't have done, you should take another dip in the crimson flood, another plunge between beneath Calvary's flow tonight. You should come and ask the Lord to apply the blood to your heart and say, Jesus, I want to be renewed tonight. And while we're praying along here, God can do a great thing. Now I'm going to pray all of you along the front. Raise your right hand to God while I pray for you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for these standing now, right now in Jesus' name. Bless them, dear Lord. Wash them in thy precious blood. Forgive them every sin. Cleanse them, I pray thee. Set them free from every bondage in the name of Jesus. I praise thee, Lord, for thy power. I praise you, you are preparing your people. You're getting your people ready for your coming, Lord. Now do a work in them. May there be a clean way tonight with everything that hinders the plan, the purpose, the will of Almighty God. In Jesus' name. Everybody along the front say this after me. I thank you, Lord, for the move of your spirit. In my heart tonight, I respond to you. I bring my life as an offering before you, Lord. Forgive me, Lord, where I have grieved you, where I have come short. Wash me in the blood. Give me a new start tonight. I start again, Lord, to serve you, to live for you, with all the determination of my being. In Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, let's all say amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Now we're going to see it again while all your workers pray. Come around the front. Come on, okay? Let's pray for these mountains. Pray.
sign is not in control. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.